Okay, so we're going to now start to talk about uh, some, uh, get into calculus, and as we do that, the first idea we talk about is the idea of a limit. In calculus, there are two problems that uh, really led to the development of calculus, and then it kind of exploded after that. So, just a little bit of an introduction uh, into calculus here. Calculus really centers itself on two questions. What calculus is really interested in. First question is if we have some curve. Like so, we ask the question, how fast is the curve changing at a given point in time? In other words, if we go to this point on the curve, we ask, well, how fast is the curve changing at that point in time? Uh, see, for a straight line, we can talk about slope, because a line goes up at a constant rate. But we can't really talk about slope for a curve, because a curve uh, is always going up at a different rate. But what we can do so that we can actually talk about slope is we say, well, let's look at the line, the straight line. Ah, oops. Let me undo that guy. Not quite going the way I want it to. Let's look at the straight line that's moving in the same direction as the graph. Okay at that point in time. And then I can look at the line and say, hey, it's a line. I can talk about its slope. So one of the questions that we ask about in calculus is the rate of change of a function. rate of change of a function. Okay. And that leads to the idea of what we'll talk about first in calculus to what's called derivatives or differentiation. So that's the one, one problem that calculus kind of centers around. And then the other problem that it centers around is if, once again, you have some curve, like so, and you have some interval between two points A and B, we ask the question, about how much area is inside the region between the curve and the x-axis. And so these were the two problems that people for various region, reasons <coughs> we're interested in asking and knowing the answer to. And we'll see as we continue on with our discussion why uh, these problems would be problems that you'd like to know the answer to. Uh, and a bit of progress is made here and there with these two different questions. I mean, a little bit more was made with the first one. Uh, the second one they found to be uh, very difficult uh, to solve. <clears throat> and it wasn't until uh, two guys, uh, both kind of independently, one a few years after the other, and you say, well, wait, uh, if the first guy did it, how come the other guy, didn't the other guy already know that he did it? You've got to understand when this happened. 
Uh, this happened in the uh, 17, 16, late 1600s, 1700s. Uh, things didn't immediately propagate out to the whole world. All right. Things took a while. So the first guy, uh, Newton, uh, was a Brit. He lived in England. And he kind of, as he discovered it, kind of kept it you know, under wraps and only shared it with a few people. Then uh, a few years later, a German guy by the name of Leibniz uh, also discovered it. And that was that these two problems, seemingly very different, are actually intimately related. Very close to being like opposites, uh, and with that, they were able to go forward and you know solve lots of problems. Now, in doing that, they were doing strange stuff, um, and they were probably a little uh, uncertain about it. But it kept giving right answers. They were doing weird things like taking zero divided by zero. Right, you can't divide zero by zero. You can take five divided by five. But you can't take zero divided by zero. And then they were doing other things like, well, what's zero times infinity? Uh, you say, well, how can I do zero times infinity? I can do one times infinity, that's infinity. I can do five times infinity, that's infinity. I take a half times infinity, that's infinity. But zero times infinity? Or, you know, what the heck's that going to be? Uh, so they were doing strange things like that, and everybody just kept doing it for about 100, 200 years. Because they kept getting uh, results that, that worked, that made sense. So they didn't understand why it worked, but it worked. So they just kept doing it. And it wasn't really until the mid-1800s uh, uh, when a guy called Riemann came, came along and said, you know what, okay, there's got to be a reason this stuff works. Uh, we're doing stuff that we really know we shouldn't be doing, and it's working. Uh, so why is it working? <clears throat> And so Riemann went back and developed the idea of limits that formalized calculus and actually legitimized that it, yeah, it did work. It wasn't just that it kept giving right answers, it actually does legitimately work. And so to discuss these two problems uh, and anything about calculus, we first have to discuss uh, the idea of a limit. We actually first have to discuss uh, the idea of a limit. So, to introduce the idea of a limit, let's talk about average velocity. Let's talk about average velocity. So here you are. You're driving down the road. So we'll imagine that's a road. And you're you're in your car. Driving a beetle, of course, or a punch buggy, you know. Uh, so you're driving down the car road, and you're all happy and excited because you got your new uh, radar detector. You're like, oh, the cops will never catch me. The cops will never catch me. Um, is that the only way that they can judge your speed? How else can they judge your speed? What do you mean, lines on the road? Yeah. So what they do, and this is how you used to judge speed back before you got fancy things like uh, radar guns and then the laser guns and all the other stuff, uh, is they would have marks, some marked place on the road, and then another marked place a certain time later. And the cop's kind of sitting off to the side here. Uh, Oh. 
then you wouldn't be able to do it all the time. There you go. It's a cop standing down there. Ha, he thinks he's going to get away with it, but he's not. So what happens is as you pass the first point, the cop hits the stopwatch, and he starts counting the time. As you pop past the second point, cop hits the stopwatch again, and he has a number. Now, the cop could sit down if he wanted to and go through a whole complicated set of computations to figure out your speed. Problem is, by that time, you're three, four miles down the road, and he's out of luck catching you. So what they do is they have pre-made charts made up that say, okay, if it takes you 5.3 seconds, you're going this fast. If it takes you this amount of time, you're going this fast. And then he gets your speed that way, and then he can you know, either hop in his car, or if he has his buddy up the street a little bit further, radios him up, says, hey, pull that guy over. He was going 78 miles an hour in a 50-mile zone, and, and so on and so on. And so what he's computing is your average velocity. What he's computing is your average velocity. Now, say we were interested in knowing your speed at exactly, uh, let's say, this point in time. So we want to know your, what we would call your instantaneous speed. Well, what we've computed here is an average. Now, it could turn out we'd get lucky and your average would be exactly that same speed at that point in time. But uh, even with the most well-developed versions of cruise control, your car doesn't always drive the same exact speed. Yeah, you're always going to fluctuate a couple miles up and down. So, what could we do to get a better estimate for speed? If we don't have our radar gun, or don't have our laser speed detector. What else could we do? Well, what if we take that interval and make it smaller. All right now we've excluded stuff. So that average should be probably closer, better. And then you keep closing in. You keep closing in closer and closer. And if you look at that sequence of values, as you get closer and closer to that actual point in time, that actual speed, you should get closer and closer to his actual speed because there's less time for it to fluctuate. Right? There's less time for it to fluctuate. So if you narrow it down to within 10 feet, now what cop's going to be able to hit a stopwatch and you know, hit it again you know, as you go over 10 feet in time? Well, obviously, that's beyond reality, but let's imagine that uh, this cop possesses a temporal device that allows him to slow time down so that he can get you down to 10 feet, and then 5 feet, and then 3 feet, and then get you in a little 6 inch interval. And as he continues to do that more and more, you're going to get better and better estimate of uh, your actual speed. And that's kind of what the limit process does, is we're going to see what happens as it actually gets closer and closer and closer and closer. Okay, that's the idea behind the limit process. And so what we're going to do now in the next example is we're going to look at uh, how we can kind of do that with an actual function.